Good morning, and welcome to the Auburn Unitarian Universalist Fellowship located on occupied ancestral Muscogee Creek Nation land. My name is Judy Collins, and I'll be serving as service associate today. We welcome each and every one of you to our service, especially those who are searching for a spiritual home. Many of us were too seeking something larger than ourselves to which we could belong, a sense of rootedness to hold us together as we create meaning. We do that well here, though not perfectly. In this congregation, we strive not for perfection, but for authenticity and for connection. Whether it's your first time with us or your hundredth time, we hope you'll find here questions that stretch you, people to befriend you, and liberal relationships that challenge you to join us in loving boldly, living justly, and we welcome radically. On behalf of the members of the fellowship, I extend a special welcome to all visitors who are joining us for the first time and to those who still feel like visitors. If you've not already done so, please fill out a digital uh, visitor card and visit auf.org slash visitor. So we may welcome you. You may also contact our minister, Rev. Chris Rothbauer at minister at auf.org with any questions or any concerns you have, please let him hear. Let us move into this service, willing to be authentic with each other, honest within ourselves and open to connection in all its forms. Our opening words are from Tanya Marquez. It is now when we are called as witnesses of the world to mend it, to change its course, to restore it. It is now when we are called to act on our values, not to hide, not to fear, but to be bold and loud. It is now that we are called to continue our fight for justice, to organize, to speak up, it is now. Let us gather. Let us give each other courage. Let us celebrate together. Es ahora que estamos llamados a ser testigos del mundo, a enmendarlo, a cambiar su curso, a restaurarlo. Es ahora que somos llamados a vivir nuestros valores, a no escondernos, a no temer, sino a ser audaces y a hacer ruido. Es ahora que somos llamados a continuar nuestra lucha por la justicia, a organizarnos, a levantar las voces. Es ahora, reunámonos, démonos valor unos a otros. Celebremos.
invite you to light your chalice with us this morning with these words from Laurel S. Sheridan. Take from life its coals, not its ashes. Fan the flames of love and justice. Join hands and hearts in common endeavor, and there will be no limit to what we can all do and achieve together. As is, our con as is our custom, we also light a candle in solidarity with the families separated at our southern border. I would like to invite you now to join us in our opening hymn, number 112 in the gray hymnal. Do you hear? The words will be shared on screen. One of the ways that we proclaim the warmth and the caring of our community is by sharing our joys, concerns, milestones. We invite those who wish to use the Zoom chat box to type your joy, concern, or milestone during the music for meditation. If you wish for your joy or concern to be acknowledged, but don't want to share it, you may also type that you have an unspoken joy or concern. Thank you to all of you who shared joys, concerns, and milestones this morning. These joys and concerns were submitted in advance for sharing, and I'm delighted to read to whom it may concern. I saw on social media that your sign was stolen. Again, feeling sad about this attack on inclusive, empathetic community, I wanted to let you know members of the Auburn community embrace and support science, acceptance, empathy, love. Please put this donation enclosed towards a new and a bigger sign Sincerely. Mm -hmm. One joy I want to include is having read this morning that our Governor Kay Ivey on this Martin Luther King weekend came out to say, to quote his very words in saying, hate perpetrates hate and that we must come to the ways of love. What a wonderful way to start a new year. May all the joys, concerns, and milestones of this community, those shared aloud and those held in silence, be received into the care and concern of all present.
Please join me in the spirit of meditation in whatever way feels right with these words from Julie Taylor. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It is not proud. Love bears all things. We know these words. Use these words when we refer to one person loving another. Love looks different when we relate to systems. Love looks different in the face of injustice. It is then that love is resistance. Love is defiant. <laughs> it is not backing down. It is staying in the streets. Love is holding all others and ourselves accountable. Love is challenging because none of us is free until all of us is free. Love is protest. Protest is love. Love bears all things. Blessed be. A religious community is like a river formed from many different streams, the streams of our lives that meet and merge and flow to the sea. As members and friends of the religious community, we share our time, our energy, our creativity, imagination, our vision, our talents, skills, gifts, and the streams of our individual lives to create a river that is both deep and broad, a river that's made of many streams it sustains life and refreshes the land through which it flows. But the river of this community also depends on our shared financial support that makes real our shared values and vision. We'll now receive an offering for, this, for the support of this religious community and for its work in the world. You are invited to give generously and joyfully as you are willing and able to make a donation online via PayPal, please visit auuf.org slash donate. If you're writing a check, please send a check payable to AUUF with a note on the memo line about whether it is for your offering or for a pledge and mail it to post office box 669, Auburn, Alabama 36831. The offering will now be gratefully received. Yeah. <clears throat> The 
stirred a song of hope arising against fear. What fear my Georgian self disappeared? In a house divided, it will surely fall. Will raging hatred dictate Georgia's way? For she'll As Georgians voted to bring a better day. But what's ahead for all throughout our USA? Long ago we heard the ancient way. Love one another. you'd have them treat you the best way to destroy your enemy is making them your friends that's true making them our friends that's true i'm a daughter of the red hills of georgia this land of sea and mountains gave me birth. But now to deal with each of you, let's pray in all we say and do to birth. Healing all the broken way. A Georgian heart, beloved community, Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you so much, youth of Birmingham and people everywhere who have marched and made difference in lives for all of us. We have a reading now from Elizabeth Nguyen. I once saw a little sign carved in wood. It read, there is only the hard way. Many of us have been harmed by theology that told us suffering was a sacrifice that would bring us closer to God. Many of us were told our suffering would redeem us, even when we knew that actual redemption would have been to be free from suffering. And so we begin, many of us are here only because of sacrifices of others. So much of what is possible to carve out in this world requires some giving up, some letting go, some sacrifice. That's the truth of that little wooden sign, there is no other way. There is only the hard way. In particular, the work of justice often asks us to do impossible, hard, terrifying things. There is no easier way. There's only this one hard way. Folks with more privilege sometimes get caught up here. If it's hard, maybe we're doing something wrong. We tell ourselves we are lulled by our experience of choosing between what a hard choice and an easier one is. Folks with less privilege know that many of our cho choices are between a horrific choice and a horrific choice. We learn to live with that and keep going. Many of us wanna do the right thing, the just thing, the generous thing, 
and also to not have to give anything at all. We want to share our opinions, but not actually donate our evenings, our weekends, our doing dishes while on the conference call to get to understand the work enough to be able to make a meaningful contribution. We want people to trust us and let us shape the vision, but not actually risk inviting folks out to dinner. Come have a cup of tea. How about beer? Or how about coming to church? Let's build a relationship that endures and carries us forward. Oh, we may want to post the cute meme without actually making the phone call to the city councilor or to our state, our national representative. We want to be part of that powerful, courageous, game-changing, direct action without the long past midnight planning meetings, the messy decision-making, frayed relationships, and the constant wondering if this is even worth it. We want to talk about being bound together in an inter interdependent web of life, but do not actually want to give our guest room to a stranger or give over our paycheck to someone we've never met or turn our schedule inside out to do what needs to be done. The word sacrifice might be too much mess for some of us too tainted by coercion and oppression. What matters more is that we are willing to live our lives in the shape of what is being asked, not hope that what we are asked to do will fit the shape of our lives. When I woke up Wednesday morning, the day after the Georgia runoffs, there was elation felt all around that morning. Reverend Raphael Warnock had won his, Janet, his Georgia Senate runoff and it looked like John Ossoff was on track to make it a double upset, restoring democratic control of the Senate in what has particularly been a difficult election season. My Facebook feed was full of folks celebrating hard fought victories and giving credit where credit was due. It was many of them, it was activists, many of them female activists of color who helped galvanize Warnock and Ossoff to victory, as well as helping to flip Georgia blue in the presidential election. It seemed nothing was going to get us down. It's amazing how even a few hours can change the mood in the world so dramatically. What we feared would happen did happen. The president's words about conspiracy of election fraud incited some of his followers to storm the Capitol in what appears to have been an attempted coup, according to the FBI, as Congress prepared to certify the electoral vote. The victory earlier in the day turned to shock and fear. How could this happen in our country? What could lead people to attempt insurrection over the words of a man who has consistently proven how dangerous he is through his autocratic tendencies? Even that day, it wasn't so far flung from our own backyard. We now know that an Auburn man was among the people who stormed the Capitol and that for months he's been posting conspiracy theories and pro-Trump propaganda on his social media. Right in our own backyard was someone who participated in an attempted insurrection. So it certainly was a hard week already when I found out that our social justice banner was stolen. As hard as it is to fathom, it seems that someone found our messages of love, acceptance, and dignity so offensive that they tore it down. 
a sign that has in the last two years been so loved in our community as a beacon of hope in a political climate that often feels stifling and fearful was deemed too subversive to continue being displayed. When I originally began planning this service way back in December, I of course didn't know any of this was going to happen. I originally envisioned it as a combination service honoring the radical spirit of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as well as looking forward past the inauguration. I don't think I realized how much that message would be so keenly needed this morning when it seems like so much of our world is so difficult to understand. Make no mistake, I don't believe that anything I've talked about so far this morning is unrelated. We are currently living in perilous times when our country is being asked to choose between a politics of fear and a politics of abundance, between building beloved community or retreating into isolation. Over the next few weeks, I hope to offer a vision for how we might move forward in the 2020s. For I feel that there has never been scarcely a more uncertain time in our lifetimes when we could use vision of a way forward. But I began to think about what I was going to say when I encountered an editorial from New York Times columnist Charles M. Blow responding to Barack Obama's remarks about defunding the police. Now, I won't stand here and say I wasn't disappointed this election season with this election season on just about every side, including leftists who seemed unwilling to work with anyone who didn't pass a doctrinal purity test. So in this column, Blow tries to take this on and he tries to make sense of this by making a distinction between politicians and activists. The politician builds a coalition by using middling philosophy and policies that appeal to the most and offend the fewest, he says. The activist is driven more by purpose, morality, and righteousness. There is a reason most of the great activists in America never became politicians, Blow says. They would have had to compromise too much of themselves and their cause. Obama is a politician, Blow believes, not an activist. And his comments on defunding the police reflect this distinction. I take some serious elements with some element, with some parts of Blow's column, including his revisionist history on just how radical Martin Luther King Jr. was to white people in the 1960s. Just because he wasn't Malcolm X blow reasons, that means King was mainstream. In practice, though, while there have certainly been exceptions over the year, perhaps most notably John Lewis, I think he is on to a distinction in how our society has functioned until very recently. Activists were the ones who, on the outside, full of vision, who agitated for change while politicians figured out how to get things done while appealing to the most number of people, thus being reelectable. So Blow believes we need both in the system, politicians to get things done and activists to push them more leftwards. Blow's formulation might seem like it's the way things are, but it's not the whole truth. While in past times, politicians like Bernie Sanders were ready to combine their beliefs and actions were the exception, there's a new generation coming to the fore of young politicians, often women and people of color, who know how to build coalitions without giving up their convictions. The most famous of these I would highlight is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who has not 
been shy about her identification with radical beliefs and has even been floated as a possible presidential candidate within the next decade. So as I struggled to process all of this, I came across a book called The Purpose of Power, How We Come Together When We Fall Apart by Alicia Garza, whom I consider to be one of the most important activists of the 2010s. In her book, Garza, who is one of the co-creators of the Black Lives Matter hashtag, talks about her own history, both as an activist and a person, and how that history informs her current struggles. Her early lessons as an organizer against gentrification in the Bayview Hunters Point neighborhood of San Francisco were full of disappointments, learning just how much power corporations have due to their wealth, influence, and connections. She writes that one of her biggest disappointments was in learning how unrepresented, underrepresented Black folks are in progressive movements. Too often, she says, progressive agendas are modeled in the image of white people and the concerns of Black communities never make it to the table. The tragic result is that progressive agendas can never be fully realized without Black folks. Under these circumstances, some Black people are willing to take what they can get. The scraps handed to them from people without their best interests at heart and hope for the best, which is why she believes so many people in Bayview Hunters Point were so willing to accept gentrification of their own neighborhood. Yes, one of Garza's early lessons, she said, was learning she couldn't count on her fellow Black folks to do the right thing just because they were Black. And you can't blame them in some ways. But at the same time, it is a lesson that I, and I think we can extend her lesson to all sorts of groups. Garza believes we need to build movements composed of both united and popular fronts. A united front is a group of people with common beliefs, analyses, values, and objectives, an organization that's in it for the long haul. I hope AUUF is a united front. A popular front, on the other hand, are coalitions of organizations that come together in short-term unity to achieve specific goals that are common to each organization who are willing to put their differences aside for a moment. She gives as an example, her being an unapologetic anti-capitalist radical working with the nation of Islam who openly promote black capitalism and whom she has deep disagreements with. However, both her organization and the nation of Islam were against gentrification of Bayview Hunters Point for different reasons. And so they were able to come together to mobilize a resistance to the oppression of the residents there. In this way, Garza says she never sacrificed her own beliefs and was able to work on a narrow issue with another organization. And in return, an amazing thing happened she started seeing some nation of Islam leaders she was working with begin to shift on their homophobic views and start listening to the perspectives of others. Our ultimate goal, Garza believes, should be to build more united fronts. But paradoxically, we're going to need more popular fronts in the meantime to shift towards that goal of more lasting unity. Now, what on earth does this have to do with the path forward in the 2020s? Given the current polarized state of the nation and the fact that many people are believing conspiracy theories and pseudoscience just because some pundit tells them it's true, 
including the current president. I don't believe that mere intellectual debates are going to shift the tone of the current American climate. If we could win by words alone, we would have done so already, I hope. We aren't going to get anything close to a united front as a nation anytime soon. And I think it's hopelessly optimistic to believe otherwise. We need other ways of organizing if we hope to make change. I've come to believe that the path forward is to build coalitions with unlikely partners. And that may mean having different reasons for doing what we do I think this is what Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez does beautifully. And it's why I don't think Charles M. Blow's separation between activists and politicians has to be the case. Ocasio-Cortez and some of her progressive allies in the House recently came under a lot of fire by some in leftist circles for voting to reelect Nancy Pelosi as Speaker of the House. Ocasio-Cortez said she believed that there were more pressing matters than distracting themselves and finding a speaker more sympathetic towards all of her beliefs. And I tend to agree. Ocasio-Cortez didn't stop being a progressive. And indeed, the very next day, it was once again in the news that she and Nancy Pelosi were sparring once again. She's not stopping. She's just recognizing what she needs to do to get things done while being true to herself. She recognizes there's a popular front that she needs to form in the moment with more moderate Democrats. How can we do this in our everyday world? I'm reminded of hearing evangelical Christian Catherine Hayhoe speak at Auburn University last year. She told a group of assembled clergy that I was a part of that when speaking to other evangelicals about climate change, she tends to focus less on the science because if, that, if the science was gonna change things, it would have already. And she tends to focus with them more about the economic impact of our changing climate. She still believes the world is in great peril and she believes the science is right, but she tries to find a way to build coalitions with people who aren't completely on board yet to show them that they have common interests. In the process of forming such coalitions, we can build relationships that have the potential not only to change a person's mind and help them see things from our perspective. It's also the beginning of being accountable to each other and being able to have hard conversations about the consequences of actions and beliefs. We'll be talking more about accountability and the importance of relationship building and movements next week. But let's just say that one of the easiest and simultaneously most difficult ways to change the world is by forming relationships. So for example, I wouldn't go to my Eastern Kentucky coal mining family with tells of rising ocean levels and greenhouse gases those seem like a distant problem to folks who live in one of the most poor areas of the nation, where kids have to move away to find jobs, where coal mining often is the only way of making a living. Instead, I would focus on the impact on their already poor towns, the unsustainability of these coal mining towns, the fact that I have lost a relative to coal mining. I never knew an uncle because he died in the coal mines. And the way green jobs could be created that pay them more while simultaneously providing safer working conditions and a better standard of living.
how do I know that this works? Well, it worked for me. If I hadn't found people willing to meet me where I was to accept that I was imperfect and yet to continue to have relationships with me, I might not be the person I am today. I certainly didn't really learn my current beliefs in my family of origin. It was through coming together and learning from one another that I am the person I am today. Now there are limits. I'm not saying you should go out and find a group of proud boys or some white nationalist and make it your job to form common bonds with them, unless you really feel like that's your calling in life, which I don't. Even Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez doesn't form a relationship with every person in Congress, you might notice. However, I am convinced that to get to the point where we have more united fronts, we must start with popular fronts before people who don't believe in love can get to folks. We must be willing to find reasons to work together rather than reasons to stay apart. And that's messy work that I don't have firm boundaries on. Alicia Garza says that after protests die down, which they almost always do, where do people go to take sustained action? Her answer is through movements that will lead us forward into the future. At a time when it feels like there's so much that needs to change, we need to build sustained movements that will change the world and sustain action. I am convinced that we need to start thinking in new ways if we hope to build the world we dream of. This isn't a call for superficial unity, but for a different way of being entirely that seeks to restore people and recognizes the paradox of needing popular support to change our systems while needing to hold folks accountable. We can do it. It will be hard. But this Martin Luther King Jr. Day, in the spirit of the inauguration, perhaps the most radical thing we can do is become activist politicians in organizations that are mobilizing to get things done while having a robust understanding of the origin of the issues that plague the world. May it be so. I would like to invite you to join me in our closing hymn, which is hymn number 1014 in the Till Hymnal, Answering the Call of Love. The words will be shared on screen.
please join me in extinguishing our chalice. You will find the words on screen. We, we extinguish, extinguish this flame, flame but, but not the light, light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Please join us now for our song benediction. Go forth into the world in peace, in peace. Be a good courage, hold fast that which is good. Go forth. Our benediction is by Robert F. Kaufman. We have come together to share our deepest concerns, speaking and singing words of inspiration and hope. We have committed ourselves to do what we can to ease the burdens of those who suffer, to stand for decency and compassion. We have pledged to work for a more wholesome environment for us and for all the generations that will follow. But these are just words. The hymns we sing are just songs. All our reflections are just idle thoughts. When we convert them all into loving and responsible action throughout the week, then and only then will this morning become what we want it to be, a time of transformation. Amen. Blessed be, and go in peace.